Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship on this snowy Sunday morning. It is a pleasure to have you here if you are in person or joining us online because you didn't want to go out this morning. We're glad to have you here. I have a parcel of announcements for this morning, so bear with me here as I go through them. First is an announcement that the Faith and Life movie that was scheduled for this evening has been canceled for tonight due to the weather. We will update you on when the next movie will be. There will be no session meeting today uh, due to a lack of actionable business, so we will have our regular meeting in March. Uh, so same day, same time next month for our next session meeting. The office will be closed tomorrow for President's Day. We will be back on our regular schedule on Tuesday. It does list a children's message in the bulletin for this morning, but I woke up with quite the cough this morning, so I will um, not do children's message in order that I will not pass on my germs to them. Um, likewise, I will leave uh, the pulpit microphone for Tim uh, for preaching and Eric for his minute for mission, and I'll just keep my germs here. Uh, we welcome Tim Lamb uh, from Glacier Presbyterian Camp this morning. He is well known to you. We are happy to have him worshiping with us this morning. Um, I think his plan is to potentially stay for coffee hour, but we're going to base that on how the roads are looking because he'd like to get back over the pass uh, sometime today. Uh, we are uh, sadly saying goodbye to our secretary, Sherry Norton, as our secretary in the office. Um, however, she is going to continue to worship and fellowship with us. Um, but she, her last day in the office will be this coming Thursday, February 25th. We will have um, a celebration and cake in Fellowship Hall for her next Sunday, February 27th. Uh, for the temporary time while we are looking for our next secretary and bookkeeper, um, Todd Spivak has agreed to fill in Monday through Thursday, regular office hours, 8 to 11.30, uh, Monday through Wednesday, 11 o'clock on Thursday. So there will be very little interruption in office hours. So you can continue to call and email and we'll get that correspondence. Looking ahead, we have a couple of items that are coming up very quickly. This is the end of the season of Epiphany today. Next week, we have the uh, Transfiguration of the Lord, and then that heads us into the season of Lent. We have a Lent devotional, which will be starting on Tuesday, March 1st. That's at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. And then we um, officially kick off Lent with an Ash Wednesday Soup Supper at 6.30 and worship service here in the sanctuary at 7 on March 2nd. We are changing slightly the way that we are doing our newsletter. We will still be sending it out by mail to everyone who wishes to receive it that way. However, if you would like to receive your newsletter by email, that's now an option. Please let us know and we will put you on that list. Are there any other announcements for this morning that I may have missed? Seeing none, let us now prayerfully enter into our worship.
God calls us into this time and into this space, from north and south and east and west, from near and from far, in brokenness and in wholeness, in joy, in sorrow, in health, in sickness. God brings us here as a people of God called to worship God. Friends, would you join with me as we call ourselves to worship this day? Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing, says our God. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. For I will give drink to my chosen people. The people I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. Please rise in body or in spirit as you are able as you join together in singing. Who is from everlasting to 
true everlasting, slow to anger, quick to forgive, and abiding in steadfast love. Our God is a God who knows our failures and yet loves us anyway. Friends, believe the good news. In Christ Jesus, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Now may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you.
Friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to tell you how good it is to be back among you, how much I appreciate Pastor Jessica's invitation to come and be among my, you're my home folks, right? As much as I love living on the lake and every morning I get to watch the sun rise over Flathead Lake, that's pretty great, but I miss being here. I'm in eastern Montana. I, I need to be where the wind blows. So, <laughs> so I'm just so happy to be here. I've got so much to share. I don't want to keep you, though. So, well, I'll, I'll do my best to be brief. First of all, I want to offer my words of gratitude for all that you do to support our camp and its ministry. Whether you participate in our adult education programs, send your kids, grandkids to summer camp, support us financially, pray for us, or just provide the opportunity for me to be here. It's, uh, your support is really greatly appreciated. I'm very grateful to the special support you provide in the person of Lauren Smith and Joe Hosek who serve on the camp committee. And I'm really thankful for them and all their common sense, which isn't particularly common among a <laughs> bunch of ministers. <laughs> the good news is, we ended the year 2021, $20,000 to the good. And in 2020, we broke even, which during the COVID year was not, not a small accomplishment. And we have full guest group bookings until June, so we should be financially profitable in 2021, or 2022. So I brought a little, I brought a bunch of stuff. You'll have to pick up your Glacier Camp water bottle. I brought our summer program, which is also available online. Please check us out at Glacier Camp Org. If you want to sign up for the Tim Talks, you can do that online. There's all sorts of resources available, so I hope you can check that out. Again, I just want to say how good it is to be here. Lots of memories, and I was thinking, I was thinking about this last night. I was thinking about Mary Lou Doherty. And I think it would be her 98th birthday, right? Because I know last year she got 97% off at the Montana Club. <laughs> um, so it's just great to come to this gathering with the Saints of Love. So thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, I'm going to share with you a text from Scripture that focuses on one of my favorite themes. The theme in Scripture of finding the way. It's one of the most important things we do in our ministry with summer camp. My guess is half of the kids that come to camp are unchurched. And so we have them for a week and what do we do? We get to show them, here's how you can find your way. And this is a great text from Isaiah 30. It talks about God and the children of Israel. And what I like about it is it compresses the story of children of Israel's belief and unbelief into just seven verses and the story of God's mercy to his chosen people. My friends, listen now to the word of God. For thus said the Lord, God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved in quietness and in trust shall be your strength. But you would not. And said, No, we will flee upon horses. Therefore you shall flee. And we will ride upon swift steeds. Therefore your pursuers shall be swift. A thousand shall flee at the threat of one at the threat of five you shall flee until you are left abandoned like a flagstaff on the top of a mountain, like a signal on a hill. Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you. Therefore he will rise up to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. Truly, O people in Zion, inhabitants of Jerusalem, you shall weep no more. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry, 
when he hears it, he will answer you. The Lord may give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teacher will not hide himself anymore, but your eyes will see your teacher. And when you turn to the right or turn to the left, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. And the text I want us to particularly focus upon is that last text, Isaiah 30, 21, the promise of grace God gives to his wayward people. When you turn to the right or when you turn to the left, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. My friends, may God bless to us a deeper and fuller understanding of this, his holy word. Let us pray. Almighty and most gracious God, giver of every good gift, out upon us, we pray a full measure of your Holy Spirit. Take our hearts and our minds and open them, that we might hear your word and be faithful as we seek to follow you in life and in death. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning I'm going to talk about finding our way, and this is the thesis, and this hasn't changed about my ministry since I was here. You're always free to disagree with me, but this is my thesis. I'm going to suggest everyone needs direction because it is so easy to lose your way. And as a test case to prove this thesis, I'll lift up the example of my brother. Some of you might remember him. He came out here about four or five times when our mother was still alive. I think Mary Lou gave the best description of my brother where she said, you know, Tim, he's weird. <laughs> that's my brother, and that's the way he's always been. He's always been maybe a sandwich short of a picnic or a few bubbles off the level, whatever, but that's my brother. That's the, just the way he is. And my brother has always struggled, at least in a literal or physical sense, he has always struggled to find a way. Uh, I've got two stories that will illustrate this. The first story happened when we made the great American family road trip in the Pontiac station wagon from Brookings, South Dakota to Minneapolis, Minnesota. I can't remember what year it was, 1969, maybe 1970. This happened when maybe I was eight and my brother was 11. My brother was afforded with lots of privileges based solely upon his age. And one of those privileges on this particular trip involved being given the job of a navigator, the navigator for this journey. I told this story to some of my camp staff and they said, well, why didn't you follow the on-screen directions? <laughs> so I could feel the age and generation there, right? Well, back in those days, we didn't have on-screen directions. We had these things called maps. <laughs> and my dad assigned my brother the role of navigator. He's to guide us to this motel where we were gonna spend a few days in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I would have loved to have been the navigator because ever since I was little, I always loved maps. My brother, he didn't care about maps. He didn't care about navigating, but he relished this assignment, you know why? because he knew how badly I wanted it. <laughs> so for the first three-fourths of our journey, going across South Dakota, Minnesota, fairly easy. My brother's job as navigator was very simple. It mostly consisted of turning around at me in the back seat and sticking out his tongue and saying <laughs> wordlessly, I'm the navigator and you're not. <laughs> And of course, I wanted to thump him in the back of the head. That would get me into more trouble, so I just kind of held my peace. 
But at the critical moment, right, we're getting into the rush hour traffic, Minneapolis, Minnesota, at a critical moment when his navigation skills were most needed, my brother failed to find the way. We were coming up on an intersection and my dad knew, okay, I know we have to turn here, but I'm not sure which way should we go? That was the urgent question. Where should I turn? And my brother, who was so clueless, he had the map upside down, <laughs> hemmed and hawed and stumbled in his reply. If I had been the navigator, I would have said, Dad, you're going to need to make a right turn heading 090 degrees. I would have been on it. But my brother, well, uh, well, uh, turn this way. And guess what? Wrong way. We end up in this part of town where I learned what the word ghetto was. <laughs> and I can still hear my mother call out, Children, lock the doors and roll up the windows, now! <laughs> my brother has forever, that's kind of the story of his life, he's always lost his way. In a physical sense. I don't know where he is in his spiritual journey, but in a physical sense, my brother struggled to find his way. Now, for, fl flash forward 40 or 45 years, I realized things with my brother hadn't changed. He still couldn't figure out how to find his way. He was planning a trip to come here to Great Falls to see mom. And he was flying from where he lives, he lives in New York City, flying out of New York LaGuardia to Great Falls International. How hard can that be? find your way to Great Falls, right? I'm sure there are lots of airlines in New York LaGuardia, but how many airlines do we have flying into Great Falls? It can't be that hard, right? Now remember, we're talking about my brother. And after he planned his trip, he only sent me his flight arrival information, which is very unusual because usually every time he came here, he would send me his entire five-page itinerary with the ticket price that he paid circled so I would know just how much a financial sacrifice he was making to see our dear mother. My brother's specialty, by the way, was always drama. It was never navigation. So I go pick him up at the airport and I said, well, Mark, how's your flight? And all he did was mutter. I had never asked any questions. Only later, did I find out what made him so grumpy? This is what happened. He booked his ticket online from this ticket brokerage called CheapoTickets.com. It's one characteristic we share. We're both cheapskates, right? <laughs> but when the cheapest ticket came up, click, he bought it. A non-refundable ticket from New York LaGuardia to Great Falls International that took him on three different airlines with four intermediate stops, Chicago, Phoenix, San Francisco, and the big one was an eight hour overnight layover in Seattle. <laughs> That's my brother. He struggles to find his way. Now the hard question I have to ask, and trying my best to be an honest preacher, I have to ask it of myself, as much as I ask it of you is how much are we like my brother? How much do we struggle to find our way if not literally then figuratively or spiritually? How simple is it for us to take a wrong turn at a critical intersection or to make a quick, poorly thought out decision with a click of a mouse that sends us to all these places we really don't want to go. It is easy. It is so very easy for a person to lose their way in the journey of life, to get off track to such an extent that you look up and suddenly you find yourself in a place that is very different and 
far away from where you wanted to be. Everybody needs direction. Everybody needs direction. When I think about it, my brother's problem really is the human problem. Getting lost is something that is so easy to do. We need help finding our way. And the promise of grace is that God offers us this help through the guidance of scripture and in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells the story of the Lord in his mercy and steadfast love, forever reaching out to his wayward people to guide them and direct them back to the way of life. This is the context of our message from Isaiah chapter 30. In verse 15, the way the people should follow is set out before them. In returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. The basic human problem is laid out in the next clause, which follows immediately that promise. And in English, it's just three words. In Hebrew, it's only two. God provides his his people with this life-sustaining, life-furthering, life-giving way, but they would not. They would not follow it. They would not go. They would not take the way that would lead them to my life, to, to life. So they ended up like my brother traveling on all these different airlines, stopping in all these different terminals, stuck for eight hours in a place he never wanted to be. The description of the children of Israel's lostness in verse 17 is highly evocative, even when you translate it into English. Having gone the wrong way, God's people suddenly find themselves left and abandoned like a flagstaff on the top of a mountain, like a signal on a hill. And then, even after they refused, God still reached out to guide his wayward people, to bring them back through this means of grace. That grace is manifest in this word, this word of guidance whispered from behind, coming softly, even tenderly, to declare, this is the way. Walk in it. In whatever kind of wilderness we face, however lost, confused, or disoriented we might find ourselves, we are blessed with this assurance, with this divine promise, of a way that will lead us to where we need to go. As God reached out to the children of Israel, so God reaches out to us with the promise of a way beyond the wilderness of our sinful pride. This is a blessing of grace. And it's a blessing of grace that is regularly needed. In the middle 1990s, when I was serving in the Judith Basin, I helped my friend put a GPS guidance system on his tractor. Judged by today's standards, this system was really quite primitive, but back in the day, it was cutting edge technology. And of course, the instructions were as thick as what you used to call a phone book. Do you remember those? <laughs> so my friend and I go through all the, uh, all the instructions, and we put it on, and we get it all set, but in order for this thing to work, it had to be calibrated exactly. And like my friend said, no matter how hard we tried, we couldn't get it locked in to that exact measurement. But we said, well, we're only a little off. You know, probably, I think the technical term is, we're just a titch off. <laughs> You'd think that would be a big deal, right? But we kept our fingers crossed. 
And when it came time to seed, he started up his tractor, he turned on his GPS guidance system, and guess what happened? The tractor takes off diagonally across the field. A very small error in setting the course turned out to be a very large error along the way. That sort of thing happens. It happens to people literally, and, but also figuratively and spiritually, where the tiniest little error ends up taking you in a direction you don't want to go, to a place where you don't want to be. And yet God's grace is divinely manifest in this promise, even when we're willfully and stubbornly lost, the voice comes, the voice of grace. When you turn to the right or turn to the left, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. I told you about the summer of 2020 where we made money at the camp. At least we broke even during the COVID year. And last year, 2021, we actually ended up $20,000 to the black. The first summer I was at the camp, it was a disaster. And I struggled. I struggled to find my way, especially the summer. It turned out to be a very, very difficult summer. And I go down into my office, put my hand on my head, and I just feel so lost. And here's one of the reasons I was so lost. I had to deal with staff. Well, I dealt with staff here, right? Lois Mitchell was the secretary for 14 years. She was a wonderful person. She even cleaned out the coffee pot in my coffee cup. And she never asked me for money for cigarettes. <laughs> um, I just expected all the staff to be just as hardworking, honest, and ethical as Lois was. Well, Lauren and Scott tried to tell me, you better go into this with your eyes open because it's not going to be easy. And it sure wasn't. During our busiest week of camp, the associate director, I trusted him to run the whole camp program. He had demonstrated enough competence for me to think he knew what he was doing, right? Well, guess what happens during the busiest week of camp? He either had or faked a mental breakdown. Based on what I know about it now, I think he just faked it. He exploded at a meeting of the counselors and ran off, and the counseling staff found him curled up in a fetal position under a table in the staff lounge sucking his thumb. Oh my gosh. And then there is the maintenance man. I could do a whole series of sermons on the maintenance man. He never met a charge account for the camp that he didn't like. And I closed some accounts, but he talked his way into stores opening up charge accounts. And um, his philosophy was always, well, if I'm going to get one thing for the camp, I might as well get six, like extension cords. If I, the camp needs one extension cord. It might, it might as well get six because you never know when you're going to need another extension cord. And, by the way, maybe if the camp doesn't need them, I can borrow them. If we had a maintenance man do that today, I would say, you're in violation of your employee agreement, and this is your notice. The next time you do that, you will be terminated with cause. But I was still learning that first summer. I was still trying to get my chops at being a boss. And so I had to deal with him. And then his girlfriend, she was the camp cook. And she was a good cook. She made the best shepherd's pie I've ever tasted. But she had no sense of portion control. And we got our food from a food service, Food Service of America. And our food service sales rep was an aggressive salesperson, always upselling. 
I think she got a trip to Hawaii because we, she sold so much stuff to us. I remember in August going up to meet the food truck, right? Guess what they're delivering? It's August. Summer camp's over. Summer camp's over. It's August. We had a reunion, family reunion of about 200 people there. So the guy comes up and he gives me this receipt to sign. And I said, well, what am I signing? He said, you're signing a receipt for chocolate bars, marshmallows, and graham crackers to make 800 s'mores. Oh, oh my gosh, what are we doing with all this stuff? Um, I go down in my office and just bang my head against the wall. I felt lost. I felt so completely lost. But there was one thing to guide me, and it was that promise born of our text, that voice of grace which reaches in to whatever measure of human chaos and promises us this means of grace. The voice which says, this is the way. Walk in it. And in spite of everything else that went on that summer, I never lost touch with that voice and that vision. And if I was ever asked, I could always articulate the way our ministry was called to do, called to go. And that's what I did in the middle of all this chaos, this mother calls. And fortunately, the office manager didn't pick up the phone. I could tell another sermon about her, but I'll save that for another time. Uh, this mother calls, and I answer the phone, Glacier Camp, and she said, well, my daughter wants to go to camp, but I have questions, and I want these questions answered before I'll sign my daughter up. I go, great, ma'am. Let me have them. What are your questions? And this is the way the lady introduced herself. She didn't say, oh, I'm Barbara or Sue or whoever. She said, first of all, you need to know I'm an atheist. Well, there was a pause. I think she was expecting me to condemn her for her unbelief. But I said, you know, ma'am, I've got friends who are atheists. We get along. I don't see why I'm not going to get along with you. And then she continued. She said, I want to know what kind of, and this was the exact word she said, indoctrination. I want to know what kind of indoctrination my daughter would be subjected to at camp. Well, she told me a story. She had a reason for asking this question because the daughter attended some community vacation Bible school, and the only thing the daughter learned at this community vacation Bible school was she and her family were reprobates because they didn't believe and they didn't go to church. So the mother told me this story. She said, will my daughter be subjected to this kind of harangue at her camp? And I explained to her, I said, a severely judgmental attitude was antithetical to my faith and my vision of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. But, I continued, we are a Christian camp. We are committed to the way of Jesus Christ and faith is at the core of what we do and who we are. And she said, well, tell me a little bit more about this. And so I summed it up for her in this way. I said, kids' lives these days are pulled in so many competing and different directions. And this is what we do. It's like we give kids a compass. We give kids a compass which points them in the direction of faith. So that when they struggle, when they are pressured in ways that are dangerous or harmful, they can remember the teachings of the Bible or the example of Jesus Christ can guide them to a better, more life-furthering place. 
After I explained that, the mother was quiet for what seemed like a long, long time. And then she concluded with this observation. She said, well, I understand. Everybody needs direction. Everybody does need direction. And from the perspective of our faith, that direction is born of the Lord who shows the way in Scripture and in the person of Jesus Christ becomes the way, the truth, and the life. Someone once asked me what my most important job as camp director is. And I could answer that question a million different ways. Besides being the camp director, I'm now the maintenance person. So if the toilet overflows, I'm the one that gets the call to fix it. Or if there's something going wrong with the plumbing, I'm on the front line to fix that. So maintenance is a critical issue, as you know, so I've got to do that. We only have two other people on staff, Lauren Newberry and Megan Newberry. And so with them, I'm also the apprentice housekeeper. I'm not a journeyman housekeeper because however hard I try, my mirrors always have streaks. <laughs> when I try and wipe them. Lori will come in and inspect what I've done in a clean room and she'll go, yes, yes, yes. You need to work on your streaks. <laughs> so helping Lori out with the lodge is very important. Being here, doing things like this, is very important. But as I look at all the different things I do, the most important thing I do as camp director, something that I need to do every day, that something I sometimes need to do every minute of every day, and that is to listen. To listen and to hear the voice of the Lord as it our guides our ministry in the way of life. When you walk to the left or turn to the right, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way. God's goodness is from everlasting to everlasting. God's blessings flow down to us and through us and with us. And when we present our offerings back to God, a portion of what we have been giving, we pray that in Christ we can show Christ's name to the world. Let us listen to our offering for you.
We pray that you would help us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, both near and far, wherever we go and with whomever we encounter. Amen. Please be seated. Per capita. You love that word. <laughs> I get asked several times a year, what's the deal with per capita? Well, if you look on the back of your bulletin, there's a little line there that says, per capita, the $62 question. It just tells you where our money goes, but it doesn't really tell us anything else. Fact is, on December 31st of every year, we count how many members we have. And then the church, Universal, sends us a bill of $62 for each one of those people. And this is where your money goes. But there's more to it than that. It's in our budget. We pay it every year. But in the last several, five, ten years, we've asked you to be generous and give us an extra $62 on top of your pledge. The reason we do that is because it helps our budget. It doesn't balance our budget. It gives us the flexibility to use that money in our mission or special giving or whatever. And we know not everybody can do that. We have some very special people in the congregation that pay for another person or for people or whatever. And we appreciate that and we thank them very much. But it's a bill that we pay just like our power bill. And we ask that you help pay the power bill, so we ask that you help pay this. If you can, thank you very much. If you can't, don't worry about it. It's just part of our life. But if you have any other questions, or you want to know some specifics on what we get back for that $62, feel free to talk to Jessica or myself later. Thanks. director was to make the camp useful for adults as well as children so that instead of just doing things with kids we have a strong adult education program and so while I was here I started the retreat it used to be called the land of lectures how boring is that right it was <laughs> kind of something like that so my friend Carrie Benton came up with the idea of the Tim Talks it's a three-day retreat at the camp starts with dinner on Sunday and goes through noon on Tuesday and we're going to discuss various topics. The first Tim talk is the week after Easter. I think it's April 24th through the 26th. We're going to be talking about Beatitudes. First we'll look at the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. But if you look at the Bible there are all sorts of different Beatitudes. And I'm going to quote the most powerful commentary I've ever heard on the Beatitudes in Matthew, and they came from Eric's dad, Bill Chickrow. <coughs> Bill and I were here for a meeting once, and we were talking. We were the only people who showed up for the meeting. So we just started talking, and Bill got the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 so profoundly. This is what he said. He said, if you understand what Jesus is saying in the Beatitudes, you know why they killed him, because it's radical. 
So I encourage you to come. You can sign up online, or all you have to do is yell at me, and I'll make sure you get signed up. And as executive director of the camp, I can give away scholarship money. So it would be very financially affordable for any of you to come. So what, what does it look like financially for a Sunday through Tuesday? Um, $199 if you're staying in a room by yourself. $99 if you're sharing a room with somebody. What do the rooms look like for someone who's never been there? They're, they're not quite as good as Scott's Motel. <laughs> but we're trying to get there. <laughs> it's a, got a bedroom. Oh, you've got your own bath. It's all sunken to the food. It has its own linens. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, we've got the lake outside. So, <laughs> yep. Although I like looking out at the new Starbucks. <laughs> and how far is that away? No, that, uh, that oh, was the Starbucks. Oh, yeah. 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 I did have a view. Yeah. Yeah. So. And where, where do people come from for tennis? They come from all over. We get people from here, we get people from First Present, Great Falls, Missoula, Hot Springs, Kalispell, Whitefish. We have a good turnout. And you do three or four a year? Three a year. Mm -hmm. Okay, well thank you for, yeah. what else do we need to know about We that? also talk about our online Bible study. Oh yeah. So we have an online Bible study and um, that's going to start March 13th, if you're interested. Millie and Milana have participated in that. It's a lot of fun. And you'd really love it because you get to see Bob and Nancy Maynard. They participate in that. And we'll be studying the Psalms of Christ's Passion. So that's an hour. You don't even have to go anywhere. All you have to do is log into your computer. That's a Zoom, Zoom mm -hmm. style yep. online. Yep. And is the link on your website, or do we have to sign up? You have to let me know. OK, and then you send us the information. Yep. Perfect. Very good. And we are planning to set, we have um, mostly mini campers this year. That's so we great. are planning to send these, we're hoping to send a small group of first heading into second graders um, the days following 4th of July. That's great. Excellent stuff. Thank you, Jessica. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here. It's wonderful to see you. And uh, I know that people are, are glad to have a chance to, to say hello. Uh, I have a couple of in, uh, pieces uh, of information for joys and concerns for today, and then I will open it up to you for what you would like to share. Uh, first, as I talked with Mary Kraft uh, on Thursday, she thanks everyone for their cards and calls and stops and considerations. She says she doesn't think she's ever eaten so well in her life. <laughs> and she's very grateful for, for all the support that she's gotten. Um, I also talked to Betty McGeorge about Betty Beelan, and Betty is doing okay. Um, as of Thursday afternoon, she had not gotten her hearing aids yet to the hospital, so really um, calling her or stopping by uh, at that point was not helpful for her, um, and she, she did not prefer company um, heading into the weekend, so, uh, but she still appreciates the people who have checked in on her and asked about how she doing um, as she has this um, hip replaced at another time due to a broken hip. Um, other joys and concerns that you would share? Yeah, Joe. was recently started to serve on committee on ministry and uh, lists of the churches in Glacier Presbytery that are currently without ministers. Uh, uh, Tim, you may know the statistics better than me. I believe that there are currently 17 churches in Glacier Presbytery mm -hmm. and seven without called pastors. So uh, that is a large number of our churches that currently do not have installed interim or designated ministers. Uh, in our denomination, 
population is not the only one facing this right now, but it is, um, it, it's just a huge gap in the, in the ministry of our presbytery. So prayers that we can find good people to, to fill in these spots. spoken aloud and the needs of our hearts, let us come before the Lord in prayer. God, in the beginning, you created the heavens and the earth. Preserve and sustain your creation, we pray. We pray for the poor and the outcasts, for you are their God. Deliver them when they are in trouble. Strengthen those who work for the poor and those who care for the sick and the infirm. We pray for leaders, both political and religious, and still them with integrity, and draw them into your presence, that they may carry out your will in the world. We pray for those who have heavy burdens, physical burdens, financial burdens, and emotional burdens. May the weight of these burdens be lifted and eased. Holy One, hear our voices and the voices of all creation as we pray to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please now rise in body or in spirit as you are able as we join in our closing hymn. Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with us all. Amen.